Well, welcome everyone. We're going to be doing conversations in optic nerve and retinal vascular disease tonight. We have Dr. Salka with us. Joe served as a professor of optometry at Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry. And he was there for 28 years. Joe, did I get the college right? I think I did that a little bit. Nova Southeastern University, right? That's correct. And it was All specifically right. 28 years and two days. 28 days, 28 years, two days. There he served as chief of uh, advanced care service, director of glaucoma service, chair of the Department of Optometric Sciences. Joe is also a founding member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and the Optometric Retina Society. Joe didn't stop there. He is the chair of the Neuroophthalmic Disorders in Optometry for the American Academy of Optometry. Joe is a gifted writer with hundreds of published articles. He is also the lead author of the annual Handbook of Ocular Disease Management, and that's by a review of optometry, and I'm sure all of us have seen or read that or used it in clinical care at some point. Joe is also a well-known lecturer, national and international, and he's currently working for Center for Sight in Sarasota, Florida. So everyone, please welcome Joe and give Joe a warm round of applause for our Sunday night uh, webinar series. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> we have a lot of stuff to cover. We're going to be heavy on optic nerve. Uh, in, in my practice, I am defaulting to the neuro op and probably 15 to 20 percent of what I see uh, is neuro op, which is actually fairly significant uh, in, uh, in a general general. Uh, med surge practice. So conversations, optic nerve, retinal vascular disease. I am or have been on a number of advisory boards, but I have no financial interest in any products. There's really no products that are going to be mentioned. So there's no conflict. And of course, this is something that I have uh, created on my own. So first patient is a 28-year-old female who presents with intermittent blurred vision and gray outs, as she, uh, she describes them, and some intermittent horizontal double vision and a chronic headache that's steadily getting worse over about two weeks. Now she claims white coat hypertension and she has a shoulder injury for it, which she was using a muscle relaxant. Her height and weight, she's about five foot three, 220 pounds. She is 20, 20 in each eye. Pupils and motilities are normal. And she looks like this. And we can see that there is obscuration of vessels, uh, major vessels, nasally, superiorly, inferiorly. There's a few juxtapapillary hemorrhages. Uh, we can see some folding of the retina between the disc and the macula, also known as Patton's lines. And there are probably a number of other questions that we wanna, we wanna ask. Is there any fever, any stiff neck? Uh, we know about headache, uh, any back pain any tinnitus or whooshing in the ears. These are a number of things that we, we want to ask is, is there any vitamin A use? Is there any uh, minocycline, tetracycline use? Uh, is there any use of oral contraceptives? You know, these are all things we want to ask. Now, well, Greg, I think it brings me all, all right to polling question number one. What is the next medical test that this patient needs? She needs an MRI, an RMRV, a CT, blood pressure measurement, or I don't know, that's why I'm here. And that is an acceptable answer to us. People are, are coming in already. We've got a good response rate already, I can see, Greg. Yeah, and we have a comment, Joe, that came in the chat box. Patient needs a spinal tap and MRI. If you look at the chat, I'm not sure how your screen is. I'm going to end now. Uh, yeah, I'm going to end the poll. Mm -hmm. And I'll share the results. All right, we see MRI. We don't have anybody for MRV. We do have a few, t few for CT, LP. BP, and I don't know, that's why I am here. And to a certain degree, most everything does have some, uh, some validity here. Now, a lot of these are very important. If I can give anything from for you to take home, 
The one that got no love, MRV, is actually a required test. Maybe not the next one, but it is a required test. So talking to her, she has a dull ringing in her ears, which she didn't associate with anything. Her blood pressure was modestly elevated, but not in a malignant hypertensive range by any means. Biomicroscopy, unremarkable, pressures were unremarkable. Visual feel, she had blind spot enlargement and a nasal step in each eye. Serology ultimately was normal. Imaging, she had normal ventricle, uh, small ventricles, otherwise normal. No mass lesion, uh, no blood, no hydrocephalus. She did undergo lumbar puncture. Her opening pressure was 510, about double what it should be. And she was diagnosed as having pseudotumor cerebri. Specifically, though, she had papilledema. That's edema of the optic nerve from elevated intracranial pressure. And it's not really a clinical diagnosis, it's a clinical suspicion. Uh, it helps to know that there is elevated intracranial pressure, but sometimes that is actually not always necessary. Now, papilledema has a few signs and symptoms. Bilateral disc edema, and it can be subtle, uh, is the rule. I can tell you in my entire career of over 30 years, I have seen one case of unilateral papilledema and it was from a mass lesion. But by and large, it is bilateral. Just like glaucoma, the superior and inferior aspect of the disc is going to be affected first. And this is where you're gonna be looking for obscuration of minor and major vessels. Ultimately, there can be obliteration of the cup. Hemorrhages are pretty common initially. There is an absence of a spontaneous venous pulsation, but I can't say I can think of any instance where that's actually helped me. And those patents folds from advancing and regressing edema is pretty well associated with, with true papilledema. The visual field defects can be highly variable from nothing to an enlarged blind spot, to arcuate defects, to severely constricted visual fields late in the disease. Now, typically because of the sym symmetry, there's no afferent defect and visual acuity typically is near normal. Symptoms, transit visual obscurations about 20 times per day from increasing axoplasmic uh, stasis. Often patients bend over or, or tilt their head down, this happens. And intermittent horizontal diplopia from a unilateral or bilateral six nerve paresis. Headache is very common, nausea and vomiting or vomiting without nausea can occur. Dizziness and tinnitus are also very common signs. Now, papilledema can come in ver various forms. There's acute, there's chronic, and there's atrophic. You know, there's also scales from one to five. I'm not going to get into that. Maybe I'll update the lecture and, and do that sometime. Acute is very mucky and wet. There's hemorrhages, there may be exudates, hyperemia, and some profound retinal nerve fiber layer edema in the juxtapapillary area. And that's what we see in the, low, in the lower left. Chronic papilledema, there's minimal hemorrhage. It's pretty dry. Collateral vessels may be forming at this point, what we see in the middle image. And atrophic will occur if the papilledema remains chronic. And it doesn't look very swollen because dead things don't swell. As the nerve becomes atrophic, it loses its edematous appearance. Now, the disc edema is resulting from axoplasmic stasis. These fluids and metabolic byproducts are regurgitating at the level of, of the prelaminar optic nerve head. In papilledema, this cerebral edema is being transmitted along this common meningeal sheath of the brain and optic nerve, giving you this, this swollen disc appearance. Now, papilledema can be, be associated from a few things. There can be increased brain volume from a mass lesion, as we see in the, in the lower left. You can have increased cerebral spinal fluid volume from hydrocephalus. You don't have to have a huge tumor. If you have a small tumor blocking cerebral spinal fluid, you can end up with a hydrocephalic state. It doesn't have to be a large tumor, it can be a small tumor, or increased blood volume from an intracranial hemorrhage. 
Now, one of the most important things we can do is try to rule out the, the masqueraders. Ultrasound can be helpful in identifying optic nerve drusen. Fundus autofluorescence can be very helpful. OCT can be beneficial as well. But we also have to look at the color, look at the margins, look for the presence or absence of spontaneous venous pulsation. If spontaneous venous pulsation is there, that cerebral, there's no cerebral edema in, increasing the, the, the fluid pressure in the optic nerve sheath. So you know you're not dealing with, with, uh, with, with true papilledema. And look for an abnormal branching pattern, like a, not a bifurcation, maybe a trifurcation. Now, acute papilledema is a medical urgency. And we need to get prompt neuroimaging to rule out uh, a mass lesion. We need to rule out venous sinus thrombosis. Now, if the imaging is normal, we're going to need a lumbar puncture, and this can be obviated in some cases, to check for the cerebral spinal fluid pressure and, and to exclude menin meningitis. Now, atrophic papilledema, significant vision loss, is pretty urgent because the patient's going blind. You know, prompt, uh, prompt therapy must be uh, in, you know, initiated in these patients. And if they have other neurologic abnormalities, such as a fever or a stiff neck, that can tell you we, we might be dealing with it with a meningitis or an intracranial infection. So these are all things that are pretty urgent. Now, if the patient's got good vision and good feel, it may not be an emergency, but it's something we're going to want to get the imaging done relatively quickly. And generally speaking, I do this through a hospital emergency room. I am will, you know, if you're willing to work with the ER physicians and the hospitalists, it's a very good way to uh, get imaging pretty urgently. Now let's talk about pseudotumor and IIH. I think a lot of people are under the misconception that IIH is the right term to use, or it's the modern term. And that's not necessarily correct. Pseudotumor just means increased intracranial pressure, but there's no tumor. But there are other causes of ages. Minocycline, tetracycline can do it. Vitamin A has been shown to do it. Oral contraceptives leading to venous sinus, thrombo venous sinus thrombosis itself. These are all causative agents. There's no tumor, and we call that pseudotumor. Now, IIH is increased intracranial pressure, but there's no associated finding. There's no tumor, there's no bleed, there's no exogenous medication use. And these are usually younger, overweight females who are at risk. So in a way, IIH is what we call primary pseudotumor. And if there is a cause, it's gonna be called secondary pseudotumor. Greg, I know you've come across this numerous times with minocycline use, do you want to do you want to share your experience there? Yeah, um, I mean, you're the one that taught me that it's really not idiopathic. Um, if we know it's from, and it makes sense, right? It's uh, secondary to minocycline or doxycycline. Um, I've seen it in children. Um, I've created it myself, uh, not that many times, but definitely seen it in children and in adults being treated for uh, acne most of the time. Um, you know, the, the drawback is, is that, you know, it's a bilateral uh, swollen nerve. So we have to get them worked up uh, despite, even though the gut spidey senses are telling us that's where it's coming from. Um, but, you know, discontinue the medication. And over a course of say six to eight weeks, you see that uh, optic nerve uh, return back to normal. And that's a great, uh, a great comment, Greg, when you talk about the spidey sense, you know, we have the supposition that we know the cause, but unless we do the evaluation, we really don't. And I've unfortunately come across situations where our colleagues have looked at bilateral disc edema in, uh, in a younger female who is over her ideal weight, her BMI is high, and they start treating the diamox without doing any of the evaluation. And you know, being at that, in that profile does not protect against meningitis, doesn't protect against intracranial bleed, and it certainly doesn't protect against uh, an intracranial tumor. So we do have to do the evaluation. 
Now, sign, making, making a pseudotumor diagnosis, we have to have the signs and symptoms that are showing us there's increased intracranial pressure. Generally speaking, headache. Papilledema, and it could be subtle. And they also have to have a normal neurologic evaluation. The only thing they're allowed to have is a unilateral or bilateral six nerve palsy. Horizontal double vision is actually really pretty common. When the, when the intracranial pressure is elevated, the brain stem herniates down through frame and magnum. Now the sixth nerve exits the pond, pons and climbs up the clivus over the petrix apex of the, of the temporal bone. So as the brain stem starts to move downwards, it stretches the sixth nerve and there's your sixth nerve paresis. Neuroimaging, which needs to be done, has to be normal. There can be no hydrocephalus, no mass, no structural lesion, and no venous sinus thrombosis. And the CSF has to be normal. Now, of course, when you have elevated opening pressure, you know, adults, you know, anything above 250 millimeters is, it is considered elevated. Now, it's getting harder and harder to get LPs done. And I don't think we really need to force it on patients because we can look at certain MRI findings. Now, what imaging is needed it's a contrast enhanced MRI of the brain, right? That is needed to rule out mass lesion, blood, hydrocephalus. You also need MRV, magnetic resonance veneography. And you have to do that because venous sinus thrombosis is a common cause of pseudotumor. So we have to have both of those. They also have to, there's no evidence of, of fever or acute infection if they're in that typical profile. And what we can see on the MRI is actually flattening of the globe. And you can see an empty salaturska. Well, salaturska has pituitary gland, which is very gelatinous and the pressure squishes it down. So an empty salaturska, flattening of the globes on MRI, typical profile, no evidence of acute infection. You know, lumbar puncture may not be done and you know, may not be necessary in a case like that. Now managing pseudotumor, if there's no vision loss, symptomatic headache therapy is going to, is going to be used. Acetazolamide, 500 milligrams TID, and it can, it, sometimes it can be even higher than that. Very tough, very, very tough drug to take. And weight reduction, somewhere between six and 10% of their body mass needs to be lost. Now, mild vision loss, acetazolamide can be used. Other diuretics, such as furosemide, zonistamide can be used. Topiramate has got the benefit of being a weak carbonic anhydrase inhibitor properties to it. And it's also an appetite suppressant for, for weight loss. So that's actually very, very beneficial. So if there's no or mild vision loss, the prognosis is, is generally excellent. And it can be managed usually in about six to nine months. Here's where we need to get involved. We need to see these patients on follow-up for photographs, OCT, and visual fields. Because once the patient gets downstream, these things are not being done. Not, they're not being done in the neurologist's office. They're not all, always under the care of a neuro-ophthalmologist and internist. You know, these things are not being done. And it's very important that we stay involved in the patient's care. Treating the primary problem, about a 6 to 10% weight loss is necessary. And to prevent recurrence, you keep the weight down. Many a time I've come across these patients where they've had an increase, you know, they, they've increased their weight, headaches goes up. Or they've lost a few pounds, headache goes down decreases. It is actually, you know, it, it's really pretty diagnostic. Now here's a patient, uh, some 17 year old, we can see the BMI is really not all that high. And we take a look, there's bilateral chronic disc edema. We have obscuration, the vessels superiorly, inferiorly, and some nasally. We have enlarged blind spots here on the OCT. We take a look at the uh, at the thickness map. It's really off the scale. You know, it's kind of a red, white, and blue pattern, and we call that uh, the Patriot sign on the cirrus. You can see that 
juxtapapillary edema of red, white, and blue is kind of like our flag. Here's a 33-year-old female complaining of horizontal diplopia, headache, and transit visual obscurations 20 times per day. She denies oral contraceptive use, no tetracyclines, no vitamin use. She had lost 10 pounds recently, you know, prior to being seen or being diagnosed, and had noted her headaches had improved. Her blood pressure is normal. She is five foot five, 160 pounds. Her BMI is slightly elevated at 26. And what do we see here? Okay, same thing. Chronic disc edema, we have obscuration of the cup, obscuration of the vessels, particularly superiorly and inferiorly. You draw you know, with a pencil, you, you start to lose it here and there. There's a bit of a superior hemifield defect in the right eye and enlarged blind spot in the left eye. We see the patriot side and a juxtapapillary neurofiber layer thickness that's off the charts. And this is a patient uh, who underwent imaging MRI, MRV. I don't believe LP was, was done in, case, in this case, but she was diagnosed ultimately with IIH or primary pseudotumor. There's no secondary causes. Now here's very important where we get involved. We take a look at this and photographically, we've gone from here to here. And I can see that there is a difference, you know, there's a diminishment of the edema. In this eye, there's a diminishment of the edema. If it worked for the photographs, I can look at visit one and visit three months later and say, there is disc edema. That's all I can say. But with photographs, I can compare them and say, therapy is working. And as we repeat the visual feel, it actually cleans up a little bit. Now, imagine this. I turn the arrows around and we go from here to here in the visual field or here at the optic nerve to here at the optic nerve. Now we tell the neurologist, now we tell the internist, the therapy is not sufficient. The patient's actually getting worse. So we, can't, we should not relinquish total, total care of these patients. We are a very important part uh, of the healthcare cycle here. Now, patients with severe or progressive vision loss need optic nerve sheath decompression, where the optic nerve sheath is surgically open, and it can be tough to find an orbital surgeon who is skilled to, or willing to do this. But this is just unbuckling your pants after Thanksgiving. You know, you're giving it a little bit more room, but the underlying problem sort of still is there. High dose IV steroids, IV acetazolamide can be used, and Many of these patients will end up with a lumboperitoneal shunt. Greg, that brings me to polling question number two. When encountering florid bilateral disc edema in a 39-year-old obese female, what is the next immediate step? Prescribe Diamox and re recommend weight loss, check blood pressure, send to the ER, perform OCT, or I don't know, that's why I'm here. Greg, anything in the chat room I should be aware of? The first thing is, is that I launched the handout. Uh, looks like it's 7.15, so it's been there for about 15 minutes. And then it says, just for a comment for the lecture, it would be nice if you had ICD and CPT codes in the lecture material, so. Okay, people are registering in their polls, doing well. And we'll end it right now. There you go. Okay, let's look at a couple of things. Prescribe Diamox and recommend weight loss. Well, we don't want to do that unless we know that they don't have a brain tumor. And this is actually truly pseudo, pseudo tumor. Uh, immediately check blood pressure. I, that's actually a very important thing to do. Whenever seeing disc edema, bilateral disc edema, always check the BP. It can be malignant hypertension. In that case, what do we do? We send the emergency room. Immediately sending to the emergency room is acceptable if you're willing to help. Information that should go, go with the patient is patient has bilateral disc edema, suspect papilledema, 
rule out intracranial hemorrhage, hydrocephalus, venous sinus thrombosis, mass lesion. Patient needs MRV with and without contrast and MRV. And I also give them my cell phone number because invariably in cases like this, I'll get a call back from the ER physician who wants to discuss the case. You know, there's, there's no anger or chastisement or how dare you, you stinking optometrist. They want, they want to discuss it and, or, or they will share their findings and ask what to do next. Perform OCT or visual field, not a bad idea as long as they're in, their, in your office, because like I said, it won't happen when, when, when we get, you know, when they get downstream. So important to remember, you know, not all swollen nerves are, are papilledema. True papilledema is an urgency and you know, we got to find the cause. Now, if the field is good and the vision is good, it is not a true emergency, but it is an urgency with the next day or two to get a patient evaluated. And there are a number of conditions that can present with papilledema, mass lesions, hydrocephalus, venous sinus thrombosis, pseudotumor. Now remember, pseudotumor is pretty much a diagnosis of exclusion. Now that's a lot to remember. So I'm gonna lead you with my ode to a swollen disc. When you think the disc is swollen, the vessels north and south will appear stolen. Not all elevated nerves are edematous, just like not all snakes are venomous. Your thought should go to papilledema, but infection and inflammation should still be in the schema. MRI, MRV, and LP are all soon to be. Remember, pseudotumor is a diagnosis of exclusion. Female and firm does not make it a foregone conclusion. Brain tumors can exist when the profile is classic. Do the evaluation so that they do not end in a casket. And if you can remember that, that's all you need to know. Greg, anything, anything you want to add here? No, I was checking out the chat box, making sure the polls are okay. Um, I know I appreciate the odes, and I'm sure the, uh, the attendees here do too. Now, neural op can be, can be made simple just be fo by following a few rules and principles. All right. Which is better, one or two? Better one, better two. Can I say it again? One is a distinguished older gentleman and the other is a distinguished middle-aged gentleman. Both ostensibly have the same disease process, but from different causes. Now, nothing about this slide should imply that either Christopher Plummer or George Clooney are my patients or were my patients. I'm not saying that but I'm also not, not saying that either. He's a 48 year old male, this came from a colleague of mine. Painless loss of visual field in left eye. He was 20, 20, but he noticed something was, was wonky when he woke up. You know, he had a flu, and this was well pr prior to COVID, uh, about three weeks before, and that probably was mostly a red herring. And clearly this is what his, it's affecting him, this new onset inferior arthroscotoma, even though he is 2020. Now we take a look and we see he's got a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, a very hyperemic swollen nerve in the left eye. He's got this small crowded <clears throat> disc at risk in the right eye. This is all glial tissue. He's got pretty much a non-existent cup and this is a Nice clinical diagnosis of non arteritic ischemic neuropathy. Compare and contrast that to 74 year old male who presents with the worst headache of his life. He is treated in a, a VA facility where he goes to their emergency service. Over a three, three week period, he sees a physician assistant, a emergency department physician, cardiologist, a nurse practitioner. Now, history is over this time. He went multiple times and he's just not feeling well. He's got eye ache, jaw pain, scalp pain, facial pain, pain, sodomness to the point he falls asleep while eating his food, malaise, and jaw claudication. Now, at the first, first visit, he was seen by a PA who diagnosed temporal mandibular joint dysfunction, even though he could open his jaw fully. 
and treated with an NSAID. The ED physician really signed off on it, didn't examine the patient. Comes back in a follow-up, they find a tick on him and he's in the Lyme endemic area. So now he's got Lyme, or diagnosed with Lyme disease and given uh, doxycycline. And at various times in the chart, vasculitis such as temporal arteritis, highly unlikely, not GCA. However, somebody ordered a sed rate and C-reactive protein, which did come back elevated, but no indication anybody saw or reviewed those results or acted upon them. Ultimately, an optometrist made the diagnosis, but it was a poor outcome. Greg brings me polling question number three. A 60-year-old patient with a headache presents with a pale, swollen optic disc. What is the best referral? A neuro-ophthalmologist, a hospital ER, an internist, a retinal specialist, or I don't know why, I don't know, and that's why I'm here. And in answering this, I want you to think about time. Okay, people are, are, are coming in. Greg, do you have I any think, questions th or comments? I, th I think it got ended. Um, let me see oh. if I can uh, relaunch the poll. Let's see. I swear I didn't touch it. All right, it says share results. Stop sharing. I'm not sure if I can. No, it doesn't matter. It'll... You got cut off there. Um, pretty no, much worries. Right, so. no worries. Neuro ophthalmologists deal with this all the time, but I will say time is of the essence. And if you can't get the patient in to be seen immediately, <clears throat> your hospital ER is probably one of, the, one of the best places to go because sudden vision loss in the elderly is giant cell arteritis until proven otherwise. Or I should say, there are five things you should think about when you have sudden vision loss in the elderly. The first is giant cell arteritis. The other four are giant cell arteritis. Anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is a hypoperfusion of the posterior ciliary circulation, the anterior optic nerve bed, and that's a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. It can be arteritic or non-arteritic. Now, mechanical features in arterial sclerotic disease is going to contribute to the non-arteritic uh, form. These are people who, are, who have high cholesterol, they're smokers, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes. Well, autoimmune vasculitis is going to be responsible for the arteritic form. There is a unilateral presentation, but a high incidence of contralateral involvement, especially with arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Fellow eye involvement occurs in 65% of these patients at an average time of 10 days. So when patients present with giant cell arteritis, the time is beginning to tick against this right away. Now, non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy can happen uh, uh, sequentially in about 15% of cases over the course of about five years. It's not by and large a bilateral condition, non-arteritic. Now, looking at arteritic versus non-arteritic, non-arteritic is a hyperemic swollen nerve. There's telangiectasis of the disc capillaries trying to reperfuse the infarcted part of the optic nerve. Whereas arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is a pale, chalky white, often swollen optic nerve. So these are, are clinical features that help us make our diagnosis. Now, non-arteritic, as I said, the risk factors include diabetes, hypertension, uh, atherosclerotic disease, high cholesterol, small optic nerves, the disc at risk. 97% of patients with non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy have a 0.2 or less CD ratio and the other 3% have been misdiagnosed. They six to one will present with an inferior defect and it's not altitudinal, but it's generally arcuate. 
And we don't have an anatomic explanation as to why six to one, it's an inferior defect. Now, these are people who can, who can actually have a progressive moderate vision loss over several days with potential of recovering three lines of acuity at six months spontaneously. But again, many of these patients do not recover. The earliest I've ever encountered this was in the late 30s and early, you know, late 30s, I think 37 years old. Uh, 40s is possible, but it can go, of course, you know, well beyond that. And important, this is painless. It is a painless loss of vision. Arteritic ischemic neuropathy is a pallid swollen nerve that can be flame-shaped hemorrhages, arterial attenuation, cotton wool spotting. Unexplained cotton wool spots in the elderly should raise your suspicion the patient may actually have temporal arteritis. And there's pain of some sort. Head pain, facial pain, ear pain, jaw pain, uh, hip, shoulder pain. But there's pain of some sort. And one thing, the things to remember is hair, stare, uh, chair. If you ask an older person, do you, do you have body pain? They're almost invariably going to say yes. But they have difficulty walking upstairs. They have difficulty getting out of a chair. And it hurts when they comb their hair. These are all things, hair, chair, stare. Now, we used to also say fair, that this was a disease of Caucasians. And we said that because we did a, it was from a population study in Olmsted County, Minnesota, where virtually everybody was Caucasian. When the same type of study was done in the Baltimore area, it was mixed 50-50 Caucasian versus people of color. So be, a person of color is not uh, protected from this disease. Usually there's severe optic nerves dysfunction and visual field defects if they're measurable, are often very similar inferior arterial defects. It is somewhat uncommon under 60, the average age is 72, but anybody over the age of 50 is at risk. All right, it's very, very important. The last, the last patient that I saw with this uh, a few weeks ago was 88 years old. Prior to that, early 60s. And of course, there's a high risk of bilateral involvement. This is one of the few true emergencies that we see in eye care. So we got to do a very careful history. We really got to ask about the non-visual symptoms. You know, headache is going to be present in about 90% of patients, scalp tenderness, jaw, jaw claudication, ear pain, arthralgias, temporal pain, malaise, uh, intermittent fevers. Greg, I'm, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. If you don't know the answer to this, it's okay. But out of all those symptoms that I just mentioned, what, what is common? Can you tell what's the common in there? Uh, you know, fatigue is what I see coming in, people just being tired out uh, when they come in, when they have uh, the, you know, giant solid rice, just, you know, yeah. fatigue kind of malaise. But based, uh, upon, based upon all these symptoms, what is their ocular exam likely to look like? Just likely to be normal. Yeah, normal. Like, yeah, that's where we can ask these questions. Yeah. But of course, we do our, our complete examination. Lab studies are going to be necessary. Sed rate is needed, but if they're on statins or NSAIDs, that's going to be it's going to be off a little bit. C-reactive protein is not affected by statins and, and NSAIDs. That's going to be a little, a little bit more helpful. Elevated platelet count uh, is also. Uh, very important. So these are all things and lowered hemoglobin levels. So these are all things that are, are ultimately going to be, are going to be uh, obtained. Now, here's a patient I saw in my practice and I am probably seeing about one temporal arteritis per month at this point, uh, mostly because we, we skew a very elderly population in Sarasota and Venice. And uh, one day a week, I go to our Englewood office where I see their parents. And nobody else in my practice wants to see these patients. They're all getting filtered toward me. But she has a anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in her right eye. Her acuity is 2400, but she's had a long-standing macular scar. Now, how does she know there's something wrong? 
Well, she has a new in new onset inferior arcuate defect. So she, even though her visual acuity is poor, she does appreciate something is different. Now talking to her, she's got a mild headache, headache that has come and come and goes, and is relieved by you know OTC analgesics. She's had some malaise and fatigue and a loss of appetite. She's lost about seven pounds over the course of a few weeks. She's got no jaw claudication, no temporal head pain, uh, no scalp pain. And she is your typical uh, Sarasota suburbanite. In fact, I think she's there in her tennis outfit. Now she's got disc edema, some mild uh, pallid, no hemorrhages, no tail injectasias. And it's a small crowded disc at risk in the other eye as well. So the question is, what do you do? She's relatively young. She's got a disc at risk. Her, her history is not gangbuster. We don't really have uh, you know, a, a, a really sick looking person here. And you may wanna you know, say, well, this is probably a non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy, but remember, Non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy is diagnosed in the negative. It isn't, isn't diagnosed by what it is, it's diagnosed by what it isn't. And how do we diagnose it? By proving it's not arteritic. And this is exactly the kind of person I'm gonna test. You know, she was sent to the emergency room and her said rate was 93. And she was put on, she was put, she was put on uh, IV steroids and was uh, then, then given oral steroids. Joe, so maybe, uh, maybe, test. Yeah. maybe go over what normal uh, sed rate is or the typical normal range. If you look at the lab, at the lab studies, it's going to say zero to 20 in most cases. If you look, if you look, if you look at the paper, it's going to come back zero to 20. Now we have all learned it's about half the patient's age. So somebody who is 90 years old, they're allowed to have up to about a 45. Now, if they're allowed to have up to 45 and their, their said rate is, is 28. Now, it's lower than we expect from knowing this disease, but it's above that range. So you're, you're in those, those kind of dangerous waters. But generally speaking, it's half the patient's, patient's age. That's what we should consider. Yeah, you just mentioned 93 and I just wanted everyone to kind of have that little reminder of you, when you chuckled, you know, I think, mm -hmm. I think we all know that a pressure of 45 is probably abnormal, but just as a little reminder of what is abnormal with that said rate. And if they have another disease or they, or they don't have this disease, their said rate is going to come back as two. And I can tell you, Joe, the last, you know, the last, say, two, I'm not seeing a monthly like you do, but I do have a, you know, an elderly population. You know, I consider someone pediatric if they're not in a bifocal. Um, and uh, with that being said, I haven't, I probably the last two were not diagnosed by, you know, an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. They've come in, you know, I've maybe knowing the patient or they're just fatigued, not feeling well they have all the other symptoms before their nerve stroked out and we were able to get them treated before they lost vision. So um, that's kind of, you know, it's kind of nice that you're reviewing this, but my last two didn't really have the anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Yeah, they have, they have the disease. They, then they have an otherwise normal exam. That's why we ask these questions or consider these things in, in, in the elderly. Now, diagnosis, you know, we, we, we talked about that, you know, we need to do the serology, uh, is, is, is temporal artery biopsy necessary? The, the answer is yes. Uh, that we have, we have to get that done. Ultrasound probably is not sensitive enough, uh, in my opinion. I've seen cases where they have the disease, the, the ultrasound, the temporal artery was, uh, it was normal. But it all depends on the pathologist. I mean, this is a disease that can, that can be missed, you know. There, there may we've heard about skip lesions. Uh, okay, well, skip lesions do happen. You may have areas of the biopsy that are there that are negative, or there are no inflammatory cells, but there is the intimal collapse. Well, that's a healed arteritis. Or, or sometimes you know mistakes get made, and, and the biopsy results come back comes back that says the uh, the temporal vein is uh, is normal. You idiot. 
Now, treatment props, steroids, hydration, something for the stomach and uh, something to help them sleep. IV is really necessary when vision loss is present because it's very effective in presenting second eye involvement. It occasionally can store, restore vision. And if they're in the hospital, you know that they are, you know, they're, they're, getting, they're getting the steroids. Now, these are all, I don't know what your experience, Greg, is my, they're all very stereotypic for me. Now, I've got an ischemic neuropathy. It is either sent to me from the ER or another physician. And I send them to the ER with detailed instructions as to what to order, what to do, and most important, my cell phone number. And depending on what time I, send, I see the patient, I can almost accurately predict when I'm going to get a call from the ER physician. And the ER physician is going to tell me what the SED rate is. He's going to or she's, he or she will say the CRP is not back yet. And we have to send that out. It's elevated. What do I do next? And that's it. They ask. They're, they're knowledgeable, but they're not experienced and they're not confident. So I tell them they, they need 250 milligram solumedrol every six hours. They need 12 doses. They need to be admitted. You need to arrange... Uh, consult with a vascular surgeon on your staff to get a biopsy done. No, you can start steroids first. You don't have to wait. You've got about two weeks. We can't wait. You have to start. When the patient's released, they have to be released into the care of rheumatology, preferably somebody on your staff. If not, call me. I'll tell you who we can use. And they need to be released on at least 80 milligrams uh, of prednisone oral until they see a rheumatologist. And then a few hours after that, I'm going to get a call from the hospitalist, the person who's actually admitting the, the, the patient, who asks the same questions. And these are all very good questions. And we, we communicate. And they're very appreciative to know how much, you know, what to do, what's the dosing, how to dose it, how, what do I do next? And they're very, very appreciative of this help. So we do it as a team effort. So always think ischemic arteritic over non-arteritic, and yes, you do the test. There's no question about it. So which is better? Better one, better two. This patient went bilaterally blind. It was not my patient. This patient had some residual field loss, but was otherwise not bothered. Now that's a lot to remember. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an O to a choked to, to, to a choked nerve, to ischemic nerve. When your patient's nerve, nerve is ischemic, you better hope the disc is hyperemic. In non-arteritic, no treatment is needed and life will really be impeded. But the disc is swollen and pale and the vision is an epic fail. If the 60s, 70s, or 80s, you're going to feel heat like you're in Hades. ESR and CRP are required and steroids must be acquired. Remember, when you see a choked disc, always assess the giant cell risk. If I can say, give you anything to take home tonight, sudden vision loss in the elderly is giant cell arteritis until proven otherwise. Greg, any comments or questions? There is a question that came as a direct message, um, but I do want to, you know, comment on, you know, I, you know, I kind of separate these out and it took me a while to kind of really separate out you know, non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy from a systemic condition affecting the optic nerve, but it's, you know, it's usually high blood pressure or something along that line. Uh, it's active, but yet, you know, not going to maybe kill the patient within a short period of time. But when you have giant cell, it's a true systemic arteritis, you know, true systemic disease that's, that's active. Uh, yeah, it's aggressive. And we just have to remember that whenever we talk about this condition. Yeah, that's it's that's my fatal. comment. Yeah, it's potentially fatal. Yeah. Do you have any, Joe, before I get to the comment, um, you know, we talk about Actemera from time to time to be used as an adjuvant and help cut back maybe the steroid dosing on the patients. Um, I'm trying to think back, you know, we talk about it. I have it in my biologic lecture. But I can, can't really say that I know of anyone around my area that has used it. Have you seen it used in your area? I have not. Actemera tocilizumab is an interleukin-6 inhibitor. And it is the first in 50 years uh, treatment, new treatment for, for giant cell arteritis. But it comes with 
some caveats. It does not replace steroids. What it does is it reduces the steroid load in tapering. These patients are gonna be on oral steroids six to 12 months and sometimes longer. Actemra is actually a steroid sparing agent. Now, it, it is not meant to treat the disease, but it is meant to reduce the overall steroid load after the patient has been urgently treated and is in the tapering six to 12 month phase. Now there's some challenges. One, it's very expensive. It's, not, it's on, limited, on restricted formularies. Two, only rheumatologists are, are allowed to use it. Three, nobody is, is comfortable as to you know, when, when to stop it. They, they, they never know when to stop or that just, you know, that, that just isn't clear at this point. Else, here's Frank? the here's yeah. the comment. The comment was um, for jaw clotification. How have the patients described this symptom to you? It is a general fatigue or ache. It's not a sharp pain. It's not a toothache. It's not like they have zoster, you know, oral zoster. It is a person like they're chewing a tough steak or a piece of beef jerky and they're chewing and chewing and their muscles of mastication get fatigued, they become ischemic. So it's more of a dull ache. It's not a sharp pain, it's not a toothache or it even comes in as a fatigue. And you should ask them in that, you know, don't ask pain while chewing. Do you get tired when you're eating your food? Does, does it, is it tough to chew? That's how we want to we want to form the question. Yeah, I've actually had patients, you know, Joe, when you're talking about steak and beef jerky and those types of foods that require lots of chewing before swallowing, they just say they had to spit it out. They just couldn't get couldn't couldn't get it done. So mm -hmm. um, that type of fatigue. So yeah, but you know, it, it, don't use the word pain. They often don't, they don't use the word pain either. It's right. like a fatigue. Well, here's a 29-year-old female referred for a glaucoma evaluation due to suspicious cupping. Has no complaints, visually asymptomatic. I used to get these all the time in the glaucoma service when I was at the university. I tell the students and residents, go, do, go give me a normal OCT and send the patient home and we can get out of here early. So we do that and the OCT comes back abnormal. The nerve fiber layer is abnormal in the left eye. Looks pretty good in the right eye. GCC looks good in the right eye. Not so good in the left eye. 29-year-old female, pressure 12 and 13. I looked already. I, I did an undilated you know, 90. It's a big cup and, and good rim tissue. And I know this patient's normal. Well, I know the patient doesn't have block home. Now, does the OCT fail me? Yeah, sometimes it does. I get some red disease. So what I usually do is I bring the patient back for visual field. She's 29 years old. She, you know, she's, she's alert, she's active. Let's do a visual field. So I do a visual field and it comes back a little abnormal. There's a small little nasal defect. Her other eye is fine. And usually what I do is, you know, I, I'll bring you back and repeat it because I know the visual field is normal. This is just, this is just a hiccup. But I repeat the same day and it's still there. All right, so we have an inferior nasal step. We have a superior nerve fiber layer and superior ganglion cell abnormality. So it looks like we're not getting home early. We're not going home early on this one. We actually have to do it the old fashioned way and actually uh, examine the patient. She's 2015 in each eye, pressure 12 and 13, thin cornea, gonial normal. But what is remarkable is she has a prominent afferent defect in the left eye much more than you would expect for that lack of, uh, you know, that, the, the, that lack of field loss and lack of nerve fiber layer, layer loss, but the very prominent apparent defect. Color vision is actually normal. And we take a look and, you know, she had large cups in HI and that's what got her referred, but she's got segmental disc pallor from about 12 o'clock to about three o'clock. So now it's not glaucoma, I was right about that, but she does have something going on. She's got optic atrophy. One of the most 
taxing type of conditions to come across. There are several forms of optic atrophy. There's primary optic atrophy, which is a uniform nerve fiber degeneration. There's glial replacement, but the optic nerve is structurally unaltered. The disc can be kind of a chalky white, but the margins are distinct. The vessels are normal. And this is what it's going to look like in, in after trauma or from direct compression. There's secondary optic atrophy from pathologic chronic disc edema, from malignant hypertension, papilledema, infiltrative disease, uh, inflammatory disease, infectious diseases. There's consecutive optic atrophy as well. These are from degenerative retinal conditions, retinitis pigmentosa, central artery occlusion. You know, it's gonna be pale and waxy type of appearance, normal margin, but also attenuation of the arterioles. Now, temporal disc pallor is a sign of toxic or nutritional disease if it's bilateral or demyelinating disease uh, or compression if it is uh, unilateral. There are many systemic potential causes of optic atrophy, sarcoid, tuberculosis, Bechet's disease, lymphoma, leukemia, lupus, uh, metabolic and nutritional disorders, uh, infectious diseases, syphilis, Lyme disease, uh, autoimmune antiphospholipid antibodies, or a number of things that can cause this. Now, looking at the optic atrophy, we can, we can put it into some category. It, it could be a past event from ischemic neuropathy, an infection or inflammation, optic neuritis, from trauma, from, from mitochondrial disease, levers, from papilledema, radiation, but be very careful that you know that these have happened. Don't make a supposition that these happen. You need some pretty concrete evidence. Retinal disease, vascular occlusion, panretinal photocoagulation, dense macular scar, inflammation. These are all potential cause, retinal causes. Or there's an active event. There is a compression, you know, in the orbit, at the chiasm, maybe it's Graves' ophthalmopathy. Genetic, it could be dominant optic atrophy or a Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy where a patient has a sudden pain, a young male has a sudden painless vision loss and about a month later, they start losing vision in the other eye. Or toxic nutritional. Remember a few medicines, ethambutol, amiodarone, amiodarone, vigabatrin. If patients are on these, these drugs, we have to be diligent in looking at the optic nerve and the vision. Uh, vitamin deficiency, alcoholism. I must've been drinking when I wrote that, Greg. Uh, <laughs> gastric, gastric bypass, you know. <laughs> B12, folate, and thymine uh, you need to be examined for. Inflammatory diseases, sarcoid, uh, infection, toxoplasmosis, Lyme disease, syphilis. You know, these are all things that may be an active event. So evaluation is going to be exhaustive. You need MRI of the orbits and of the orbits, chiasm, and the brain with and without contrast. All right. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to specify, very important, brain, orbits and chiasm, two different scans. Very important to remember that. Now, when you do a brain scan, you get orbits and chiasm. You do orbits and chiasm, you get some brain, but it's not specific. These are two different things. Brain MRI with and without contrast, orbit and chiasm with and without contrast, fat suppression in the orbits. Fat is going to glow white, things that happen to the optic nerve will make it glow white. It's like trying a snowball in a snowstorm, you need fat suppression. These are all things that we can share and tell the physicians we're working with when, we order, when, when these tests are getting ordered. Serology, CBC, RPR, ANA, ACE, uh, NMO, IgG, anti antibodies, double-stranded DNA, sed rate, C-reactive protein, B12, folate, thymine, and maybe in copper and heavy metal, metal, metal screen, though I don't typically put that in there. 
Chest x-rays can be very helpful for sarcoidosis and tuberculosis. You have to do something. All cases of optic pallor or optic atrophy have to be explained or investigated. Temporal pallor, big macular scar, I'm done. Disc pallor, PRP, I'm not worried. Sudden painless vision loss, you know, three, three years ago, pale disc, attenuated vessels, artery occlusion. But if you write down disc pallor optic atrophy and don't do an evaluation, you might as well say, I think the patient has a brain tumor. I choose to do nothing about it. Now, do I do this myself? The answer is I generally work with somebody else. I'll order the imaging if it is convenient. If there is another convenient way to do it, I will do that often with their primary care physician. But I, get, I, I actually give the note, but I write the order out and I send it to the PCP if we're going to go in that direction. So they know exactly what to order. And I will give them orders, or I write, I write, write out the lab orders for all these tests, and I'll send it to the PCP. And I can tell you invariably, and I'm working with you know, allopathic physicians, osteopathic physicians, many times physician assistants and nurse practitioners. I can tell you invariably, these are all people who are thankful for the help. They are, they are more than willing to get involved. They, they, they never start with, I'll take it from here, Sonny. Don't worry, I got this one. They all appreciate the help that we can give them. And we work together. Now with this, I did, or, I did, the, I did the MRI, the orbits, which was normal. After that, I was working with her primary care physician. Uh, he ordered the MRI, no lesions. He ordered the serologic panel that I recommended. It all came back negative, RPR, HIV, all non-reactive. Over a period of time, I followed her on visual fields. After about two years, there was no change in visual fields. Done. Yeah, we, you know, no, 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 no cause identified, but we did our fiduciary duty. You may never find the exact cause. A lot of times in neuro-op, the cause is not overt. Greg, any comments or questions in the chat? Uh, no questions in the chat and uh, no comments. Any comments from you, Greg? Um, or questions? No, I have, uh, I've had a, well, I guess, yeah, I have a comment. I guess, I guess I said no, but I have a comment. Um, in the last two years, I've seen an ethambutol uh, uh, optic neuropathy. So be aware they're out there. Mm -hmm. And the important thing is when you see that patient in the 2030, it's not like when you see the patient for the first time in the 2400, you know, 2030. And if we fail to recognize that this is a potential cause, you know, we can end up uh, it, looking at the, the business end of a malpractice suit. I can tell you that both of those patients, whenever they start having the optic neuropathy, was um, it was wasn't subtle, and they came in kind of you know one came in just on a glaucoma checkup, yeah, and she's like, yeah, I noticed my vision get a little blurry, but it wasn't that concerning, and so it's kind of a slow onset, is what I would like to say that's out there. Uh, so the and I'm going to echo what you said there is, don't blow off those little changes in vision unless you have a reason for it. Well, here's what I call a family affair. She's a 56-year-old glaucoma patient who had been diagnosed five years earlier elsewhere, complaining of a slowly progressive loss of vision. She's light perception right eye, 20-30 left, had been using a combination medicine, but had ran out several months ago when I saw her for the first time. Her pressure is 19 and 18. Pachymetry is non-revealing. Uh, and we look and we see a general diffuse pallor uh, to both eyes. I can't get a visual field in her right eye because of the poor vision, but the left eye, I can certainly get a visual field and we have a very sharp vertical defect. And this is the person I'm actually gonna scan. We can certainly, you know, we come up, she had a large pituitary macroadenoma. Very similar, 54 year old male referred for glaucoma management to me. Told he had glaucoma six years earlier in another country, underwent no treatment, don't know why. 
He's 20, 30, and hand motion right and left thigh, respectively. His pressures are 30 and 23, certainly in the glaucoma's risk factor zone. We take a look and looking at the photograph side by side, I can see a difference in coloration. The right nerve is pink and perfuse. The left nerve is somewhat diffusely more pale. The cupping certainly does not match the vision. And this is the person when we run the visual field comes out looking like this. He has a bitemporal defect. He has a very large pituitary macroadenoma that is, um, that is uh, actually, actually compressing the posterior aspect of the, of the left optic nerve, giving the pallor. I can tell you the OCT didn't look uh, very unusual in this patient at all. That's why visual fields are, are necessary in the age of imaging because sometimes it's not glaucoma. And these patients both have compressive optic neuropathies from compression of the optic nerve in the orbits at the orbital apex or at the chiasm. You can have space occupying lesion tumor masses, infiltrative extraocular muscles, Graves ophthalmopathy. That's actually the number one cause of compressive optic neuropathy. So your thyroid patients and your Graves patients we need to be very diligent about following them because this is, it's not tumor, it is Graves ophthalmopathy, the number one cause of compressive neuropathy. If it's orbital disease, it's typically unilateral, but it can be bilateral and Graves disease. And the key is a slowly progressive loss of vision. And that's what the patients all say. Now, the visual fields can be consistent with papilledema early stages, ischemic neuropathy and glaucoma in later stages. Now, there are diseases such as ischemic neuropathies and, and compressive lesions that can cause a concentric increase in the cup to disc ratio, often with vision loss and often with pallor. But it doesn't notch the neural retinal rib. It could be a concentric enlargement of the cup. Glaucoma causes notching of the neuroretinal rib. That's very important to remember. So there are diseases that increase the cup size, but they don't affect the rim preferential. Now that is a lot to remember. So I'm gonna give you my ode to a cup disc. Ode to have a cup disc pink that my friend half the glaucoma is stink. But to have a cup disc pale causes glaucoma, you shall fail. Disc and field damage is one side, it simply cannot be abided. It might be trauma, infarct, or meningioma, but if the rim is cut, always remember nothing notches a nerve like glaucoma. So a pale cupped nerve is not glaucoma. A pink notched nerve is glaucoma. A pale notched nerve is glaucoma and something else. Greg, am I good to, pro 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 to progress on? Do you have any questions, comments, or is there anything in the chat room? Yeah, I do have a comment, but uh, I do uh, owe an apology to James here. There was a comment, I just didn't scroll down far enough. Um, back to, I believe, when your patient had the atrophy, it said, did you see the atrophy when you looked with a 90 lens or did you see it on the photo? I saw it dilated and on the photo, that's a great question. Undilated, I wasn't looking for it. You know, undilated, I'm looking to see, you know, is there, is, I was looking to see what is the nerve notched and it was not. I just saw a big, big cup. I saw symmetrical rims. That's, you know, I, I didn't appreciate pallor undilated. So that's the beauty of dilation and photography. Yeah, I think we're starting to get away with photography with all the other stuff that's out there, but uh, I'm a big, big fan of photography. My comment's going to be, I'm putting together a lecture on uh, GCC findings other than in glaucoma. Um, you can find it, you know, with, you know, people had stroke, you get the, the retrograde, I guess, degeneration, if I said that right. Um, you can also, Joe, you mentioned with your pituitary and I was trying to find real quick if I had the printed article and I thought I may have had it scanned on my computer here, but I believe there was one study or a couple of studies out there that said for pituitary adenoma, you might be able to pick up with the GCC loss three years early. I might have to dig in and see what that is a little bit more. But anyway, with that being said, 
you know, you get a bitemporal hemianopia on the visual field. You can get a binasal defect. So I do get uh, patients that are being followed for pituitary tumor, so on and so forth. I have resorted to following them with, uh, you know, an OCT looking for the binasal defect. And what I've seen is it can be very asymmetric. So be mm -hmm. careful with those. Um, and then you can maybe end up getting the visual field defect. So kind of maybe use them both. Uh, but it's been fun putting this, this lecture together, this GCC lecture, other than glaucoma. So. Yeah, it, it, it's just like visual field. You get a horizontal, uh, horizontal cut in the GCC, you're looking at glaucoma. You get a vertical cut, you're looking at something neurogenic. All right, she's a 42-year-old female, painless loss of vision, left eye for a week, getting worse, not getting any better. It began as a dimming, then ra dr rapidly dropped off. All right, she's 20, 20, 2400. She's got a mild afferent defect in the left eye. And that's actually an important part of the diagnosis. Uh, confrontation fields were full. She didn't have a central scotoma on her, you know, on the Amsler. Bottom microscopy is normal. Pressures were normal. And she looked like this. We, and we have probably a, like a, a grade five uh, disc edema here. It is strictly unilateral. There's a accumulation uh, of exudate within the macular region pointing toward, you know, from the disc to the macular region. And I think this is pretty classic of a, a neuroretinitis or one we should say an infection. Now talking about it, talking to her, she has no known HIV risk factors. Uh, she didn't have a severe flu with malaise and fever and lymphadenopathy about a month earlier. This is well pre-COVID, so we can't blame COVID on this. No tick bites or rashes, but she is exposed to cats. Serologically, she was negative FTABS, RPR for syphilis, HIV, Lyme disease was negative, toxoplasmosis was ne negative, Pariasis was negative, PPD was negative, but she did turn in positive Bartonella hensley. So her diagnosis was cat scratch neuroretinitis, or more broadly, she has an infectious optic neuropathy. Now there are a number of things that can do it. Common syphilis, give you a retro bulbar, a bulbar papillopathy, a neuroretinitis, as we see here, or a perineuritis. Now, what does perineuritis look like? A, a edematous optic nerve with good vision. And that is clear, or that can be clearly seen uh, on an MRI looking in the, in, the, uh, in the coronal section, you can actually see optic nerve sheath enhancement. And that's something I specifically will ask for. Lyme disease is very similar to, to syphilis. Both are spirochetal bacteria. One is Treponema pallidum, the other is Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, of course, Lyme disease comes from the bite of the deer tick. These are people who are, a lot, are around large mammals. They, they are in the woods a lot. Deer hunters, other, other mammals, farm animals, they can get this. It is so similar that patients with syphilis and Lyme can cross-react on the antibody test. Someone some, you know, some of the Lyme disease can test positive for syphilis and, and vice versa. Other things, toxoplasmosis, uh, HIV, cytomegalovirus, very destructive division. Neuroretinitis is typically a benign lymphoreticulosis, so we know as cat scratch disease. The APD is very mild compared to the vision loss. Uh, that tells us more, it's more retina than it is neuro. And these patients will have a serous macular detachment, not just fluid, not cystoid macular edema, but a detachment from the optic nerve to the, to the macula. The macular star, the exudates, the, the ring around the bathtub after the, after the water has drained is a relatively late finding. It just takes a couple of weeks for that to really show up. But the serous detachment is very, very prominent. Bring out the OCT, it really will show this. When you have unilateral disc edema and you don't see any exudates, that can still be neuroretinitis. And neuroretinitis has a lot of potential causes, but the most common being cat scratch disease. 
Here's an example. Here's a patient with strep complaint who has been diagnosed with strep throat, 62 year old female. Count fingers at eight feet, very mild APD, already on antibiotics for quote unquote strep throat. And we can see swollen optic nerve. There is no egg chains, but there is our macular detachment, the serous macular detachment. This is a patient who has neuroretinitis of some other infective organism. So neuroretinitis, as well as infectious optic neuropathy, there are many potential etiologies, toxoplasmosis, coriasis, measles, syphilis, Lyme disease, uh, herpes, tuberculosis, you know, malignant hypertension ischemic neuropathy can look like a neuroretinitis. Leptospirosis, Bartonella, that's the most common. Fleas are the vector, that's so you don't really have to have a scratch. Prognosis is excellent, especially if it's cat scratch disease. Most people are gonna have a normal or near normal return to vision. Now, antibiotics have been used. Uh, there's no studies that say they're any better. Doxycycline, 100 milligrams uh, by, you know, twice a day by mouth for a month is probably the most common thing. I would probably do that because that way it shows the patients we're doing something. Uh, doctors have in, injected Avastin because, you know, what the heck, you know, when in doubt, inject Avastin, I guess. No, no, uh, no evidence really helps. Now, if there is another cause, we have to treat the cause. You know, another effective cause, syphilis or Lyme disease, there must be treatment for it. But uh, cat scratch disease, or that's the diagnosis, it's going to get better whether you do, you do nothing or you, you treat them with antibiotics. Now that's a lot to remember. So I'm going to leave you my ode to an effective nerve. When the vision is poor and the APD mild, it's often a bite of something wild. If the disc is swollen and macula is swelling great, it's neuroretinitis and the star comes late. Syphilis and Lyme are much alike and cause similar titers to spike. One is sexually transmitted, the other not, unless the patient's weirder than he thought. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a, a breather, Greg. Is or is there any questions out there? Yeah, one rolled in. It said um, for the Graves disease, do you routinely run a visual field without visual field without visual changes? Maybe vision changes. I typically will not uh, unless a patient you know comes in is their disease is not well controlled. They're very proptotic. You know, if they have motility deficits, I think it's probably a good idea to run a visual field. Probably get a disc photograph as baseline as well as an OCT. Yeah, I think just to remind everyone out there that Graves' disease is an orbital disease, right? That's congestion. It's an it's an inflammatory disease. Now we say Graves' disease. That would mean that it's tied into hyperthyroid. But you can get in, and if you had a Graves disease um, support group, or if you had a um, thyroid eye disease support group, 90% would be from Graves, 10 would be from U thyroid, and 10% would be from hypo. So it typically is from the hyper. But remember, it's a it's a it's an inflammatory congestive disease of the orbit. So why I say all that is I do do. Um, X ophthalmometry measurements on most of my uh, thyroid disease, especially if they're having the soft tissue involvement, the lids, the swollen, you know, the SLK type of appearance. And if they start getting some asymmetry between their X ophthalmometry measurements, then it's time to maybe do the visual field. So maybe I don't do it on every single one, but um, which I don't, but maybe that will give you some clue on when to do it, at least from a clinical standpoint, when you start getting that asymmetry on your X ophthalmometry or getting some congestion or redness uh, to the orbits. Excellent, Greg. Here's one that rolled in, Joe, just, just as we're talking. Do you see any advantages to performing FDT frequency doubling technology visual field studies as a pre-screening test accuracy of frequency doubling technology? Well, the answer is yes. It, it, it's good technology. It's very beneficial as, as a screener. Uh, it, it does have a lot, a lot of false positives, so you may have to run the test again or explain it away. But remember, neurologic disease is relatively 
obvious. I mean, it's, it's, it's not subtle. You don't, you don't need to use a ACETA standard uh, on these patients. So ACETA faster is fine because you're looking for very gross or obvious things. And those are usually picked up pretty well in FDT. My only comment on that would be to, when you do find things, it doesn't always mean disease, right? So it's kind of like doing OCTs. You know, it could be a, a, you know, a tilted nerve head, a tilted disc, so on and so forth. And so I have uh, an optometrist in town that does FDDs all the time and finds things. And it's usually, you know, it's usually something that's just kind of normal. I mean, it's abnormal because it found something, but it's not a disease process. It's usually something. So just learning how to interpret it um, that has a whole you know, level to it. Well, of course, this talk is always optic nerve heavy. Maybe I should just leave, limit it to optic nerve, but I do want to talk about a little, little bit about retina to share a few things. And the first case is, I, 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 I don't feel so good. He's a 66-year-old uh, African-American male who has a sudden painless uh, loss of vision of three days duration. Uh, he's had no previous eye or medical care. In fact, I think his last physical came complete with an, with a, with an APGAR score when he was pronounced healthy at birth. And he comes and he wants clear, you know, glasses to clear his vision. So he's, he is 20, 30 and hand motion with an apparent defect. Now, he's got a good appetite, but a poor diet. You know, I ask him, you know, what he eats and he eats, you know, a lot of, uh, tacos and Doritos and Cheerios and Oreos and everything ends in O's is what he eats. And uh, I have a picture here of the godfather of soul, James Brown, only that they share the same name, both of J names James Brown. And I'm, I'm not going, I'm not, I'm not violating his, uh, his HIPAA. You'll see why in just a moment. And what we can see there is he has got a pale swollen uh, retina a cherry red spot. He has uh, attenuated arterioles, and he's got a class, a classic central retinal artery occlusion. And I want to I want to stress to you that not all artery occlusions are are classic. And I know there's probably at least one person on this uh, webinar tonight that would would attest to that. And this is a painless, sudden loss of vision, uh, often less than 2,400. You know, the, the, if there is a ciliary retinal artery, vision may even be in the 2030, 2040 level. The retina is going to be very edematous and white. That cherry red spot is that underlying cortical circulation. Usually it's older patients, 60s and above now. I guess, unfortunately, for, for sake of conversation, elderly now encompasses 50. You know, these th things start to go, go askew after the age of 50. So anybody under, usually up, usually up until, up until pu puberty for me, up until puberty is child. Puberty to 50 is young adult and after 50 is, is older adult. Now, initially within the first few hours, it's going to look normal. You know, you can have you can have a retinal artery occlusion without these findings. Don't be fooled. When somebody has sudden vision loss, the find the 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 non you know the the organ the, the organic findings after you know afferent defect, sudden vision loss, painless. We're more likely than not dealing with an artery occlusion, and it just hasn't been enough time. Now, weeks later, it's going to have optic atrophy, but you're going to have those thready attenuated vessels. But very rarely, you know, they most are classic, but when you see them, it may not be a classic appearance. So can Frank, you go back? Can you go back to that picture? Just got a couple of comments just to make. So, mm -hmm. you know, this picture I would say is probably, you know, it's definitely not day one. This patient could have total vision loss um, and the retina can still look normal. Uh, I would say this is at least three or four days out because you got that classic cherry red spot. But what I like to point out here to the audience or to the attendees tonight is that that's the largest cotton wool spot that you'll see. That whole retina, that whole nerve fiber layer, that's what a cotton wool spot is. A cotton wool spot is a focal little area of nerve fiber layer retinal edema. This whole area is swollen. That's why you don't really see. And then where there's no nerve fiber layer is in the fovea. 
the foveola area and fovea is that you don't have any swelling there and that's why you see the choroidal circulation. So that's your largest cotton wool spot that you're ever gonna see. That's an, that's an excellent point, Greg. That brings me to point question four. A 60 year old patient presents with an acute central retinal artery occlusion. What is the best management plan? Immediate referral to a stroke unit, immediate referral to a retinal specialist, immediately breathing into a brown paper bag <laughs> with pressure reduction, Meet referral to a neuro-ophthalmologist, or I don't know, and that's why I'm here, which we feel is an acceptable answer. No other comments. Um, I did launch the handout a second time quite a ways back at four at 7.40. Oh, something just popped in. So someone said, what about doing a paracentesis question mark? You don't have that on your list. So I guess they're throwing that in there. And would you suspect GCA also that came in privately? So The answer is paracentesis have been done. Uh, retinal specialists have done that, generally with mixed results. The, the whole idea is you're trying to lower the pressure in the eye so there is an emboli you can spit uh, you can spit something you know further down the uh, vascular tree and yes you always suspect giant cell arteritis in central artery occlusions about five percent of CR CRAOs are not embolic but they are giant cell arteritis and that's why I was discussing his other, his, his appetite there all right, so immediate re referral to a stroke unit, uh, two thirds of the re respondents said that. Retinal specialist, uh, breathing into a brown paper bag and pressure reduction, referral to a neuro-ophthalmologist, and I don't know why, I don't know, that's why I'm here. Well, we're gonna share that with you. Now, most of the time, this is emboli from the heart or the carotid lodging at the, the lamina cribrosa. And more commonly, it, it is cardiac, uh, of origin because those are calcific emboli and they have a tendency to impact the vessel causing cessation of blood flow. Cholesterol emboli tend to be more malleable. They tend to move along uh, further down the vascular tree. That's why they don't always stay there. It can certainly cause an artery occlusion, but the, uh, the calcific and the fiber and platelet uh, emboli tend to be the more common, common ones causing, uh, causing artery occlusions. But there are other, other causes, interluminal thrombosis, dissecting aneurysm, and giant cell. About 5% of central artery occlusions are caused uh, by giant cell arteritis. And one may ask, why is, it, why is it so low? Well, giant cell arteritis affects medium and large arteries. The central retinal artery is only large enough for the proper vascular wall constituents for a very short part of its course to be affected by giant cells. So most of the central artery, retinal artery, is too small to be involved uh, by giant cell. And certainly branch arterioles are not going to be involved in, by giant cell because they're, they're just way too small. Now, of course, you know, the, the heroic treatment, paracentesis, uh, carbogen, where they breathe carbon dioxide and oxygen in the hospital, digital massage, hyperventilation, breathing into a brown paper bag. No matter where we were trained, there's always a brown paper bag, nor the color is allowed. Clot busters, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. That actually, retinal artery occlusion is one of the indications for hyperbaric oxygen. The reality is none of it really works. There may be some anecdotal return. Generally speaking, you know, I, I, I talked about this at an event that was hosted by a retina only practice. They had six retinal specialists uh, in the back of the room listening to, the, to this talk uh, about, about artery occlusion. I, I walked back and I, I looked at all of them and said, have you any, any of you had any success with that at all? And they started looking at each other back and forth and said, no, it just doesn't work. Now there are a number of systemic uh, considerations, hypertension, diabetes, atherosclerosis, giant cell. That's mostly in the older patients. Now, 
younger patients, antiphospholipid antibodies, uh, infectious endocarditis, uh, cardiac valvular disease, uh, hyperviscosity syndromes. There are more things to consider in younger people when this happens in older people. There's a relatively finite list of diseases that can explain this. Now, of course, we, we have to worry about cerebrovascular action. Now, the number one cause of death overall is myocardial infarction. The nine-year mortality is about 56%. Really, what we have to do is worry about stroke in the, in, in the immediacy. Now, here's what happened with the James. I diagnosed him with a retinal artery occlusion. And we had a discussion and he was very, very calm and nonchalant about it. He, he really wasn't that, that, uh, not that uh, effective. He, he kept questioning whether or not glasses would work. And I told him, you know, glasses would not work. So, okay. You know, he's blind in one eye and saying, all right, things happen. I recommended him for a primary care evaluation, referred him off. And I sent him for a three month, don't fall through the crack uh, follow up. And to my surprise, he, uh, he did go uh, and got a physical and had been diagnosed with hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia. And we came back three months later, said, hey, Mr. Brown, how you doing? His response is, I'm scared. He had several toes amputated from diabetes and within a year, he passed away from a heart attack. So that's why I'm not violating his HIPAA, he's no longer with us. And that's what he did then. What do we do now? Well, now we refer them to a stroke unit. And that is the most important thing that we can, uh, we can share with you right now. Any patient with any ret retinal arterial um, cessation, or, you know, retinal hypoxia, retinal infarct, retinal ischemia, these patients have to be immediately evaluated for cerebral infarction and cardiac ischemia. This is retinal artery occlusions. This is central artery occlusions, branch artery occlusions, and yes, transient ischemic attacks, transient monocular vision loss. These are now considered to be cerebral emergencies. Patients with acute retinal arterial ischemia, as Greg has pointed out many times, this is not vein occlusion. These are artery occlusions. These people need immediate brain imaging. They need a brain MRI with diffusion weighted imaging. This is much, much, much better than a head CT. I can tell you when a patient goes to the emergency room, the first thing and often the only thing they're going to get is a head CT. Why? It's what they do. They want to rule out intracranial bleed. No intracranial bleed, they start looking to refer the patient elsewhere. But what we're looking for are these acute lacunar infarcts on diffusion weighted MRI. And the diffusion weighted imaging is just a technique that identifies very acute ischemia. If they have these lesions, they're at a higher risk of a catastrophic stroke. So patients with retinal artery occlusion, central branch artery occlusion, of course, they're gonna get evaluated for, for, for giant cell arteritis. That is subsequent they need to be sent to a stroke ready hospital. And this is something that has come from doctors, Nancy Newman and Val Valerie Ruiz. They have been crusaders talking to, to all eye care providers that patients with artery occlusion and TIAs, the person who has transient monocular vision loss, these are people who are at high risk of catastrophic stroke. About a third of the patients with central or branch artery occlusions and about 18% of patients with transient vision loss have these abnormalities. Now, if this shows up, they're gonna be admitted to the hospital and they're gonna be given, given support to prevent stroke. 
If it isn't, these are not present, they'll be released. And then of course we have to do our evaluation for giant cell arteritis. And then we have to get the patient to a cardiologist or internist for ongoing systemic care. But this is something that has changed in the last several years. Now, I was involved in a white paper. Uh, I was asked to, uh, to review it and, and help. Uh, get it disseminated and, and uh, endorsed by the Academy of Optometry. And it was from the American Heart Association. The American Heart Association is now actually rewriting their guidelines of what is stroke, that a central retinal artery occlusion is now stroke. The American Heart Association considers CRAO stroke, not an eye stroke, stroke. Greg, I know you like to talk about this a lot. Uh, is there anything that I'm missing here that you'd like to add in here? Um, the only thing, no, you did, you covered it well. I don't think you're missing anything. I will just kind of echo the person that said, you know, I would suspect this G, you know, this person to be GCA. And absolutely. But in this case, they had a stroke, you know, to the eye in a sense, but it is a stroke. And that's why we send them off to a stroke ready hospital. If they don't have a stroke or they're not, or if this is from giant cell, what better place for them to be? Those docs that are, that are certified as acute stroke retinal or acute stroke doctors, um, they know how to handle GCA too. So it's the best place for them to be uh, that's out there. And one of the best things that you can do when you send them to the stroke ready hospital, the, the emergency room that is equipped to do that is give the information. Patient has had a central artery occlusion. Patient has had a retinal stroke. You can say that now. These are all things. And the most important thing I, I can do is I give them my cell phone number because eventually they're gonna to wanna to call and talk with you about this. Not challenge you, but they wanna talk with you about this. Uh, I was on call for my practice uh, sometime last year and, and I, got a, I got a call from about 11 o'clock at night from an ER physician at uh, Sarasota Memorial. He goes, I'd like to run a case by you if you don't mind. I said, sure. And he described a patient with uh, transient monocular vision loss and from the description, it sounded like a true TIA or what we used to call amaurosis fugue. Actually, we don't use that term anymore. We call them transient ischemic attacks. And he said, so what do I do? He said, I've done a CT of the head. Is that good enough? I said, no, we need diffusion weighted MRI. He said, uh, if, it's, if it's negative, do I tell him to see it tomorrow? I said, yes. And, you know, and if it's positive, do I get him to neurology tonight? I said, yes. You know, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a sharing of information and it was, you know, it was, it felt, felt good to help them and they, they're looking for any sort of help that we can give them, but it's critical to get this done within 24 to 40 hours to effectively prevent, uh, prevent stroke. So, so, so a comment, and there's a comment that came in, Joe, that might be uh, our question that came in. It might be good right where you're what you just were leading there to, you said, you know, if it just happened, get them there. This one says, if a patient describes a TIA event, but it was months previous, what is the protocol? Great question. The answer is we don't know. Nancy Newman and Valerie Bruce, who are friends of ours, and we talked about this extensively. They said they don't know either. My record, but I've had patients like this. And one patient in particular, who's a glaucoma patient, what I told her was, if this happens again, do not come back to me. Go right to the stroke unit. So do I do, I don't do a workup at that point. We've assessed that what it could be. I tell them if it happens again, go right to the stroke unit. And I tell them exactly which one to use. You, you have it up on the screen there about, you know, it says the American Heart, Heart Stroke Association certified. What I do want to point out, and one thing I'll you probably or advice if you haven't done it already, one, these stroke ready hospitals come in different levels. So there's kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm certified and I can recognize it, know what to do. And then there's different levels of you know acute stroke ready hospitals. So I would encourage you to find your stroke ready hospitals 
in your area uh, because these are now one of the easiest things to treat when they come in. You send them straight there, but you need to know where straight there is, which hospital, not every hospital, at least in my area, is a certified. And you can look that up pretty easily and find those. Joe, there's another one that says, what if the patients are under 60? Would you still do GCA workup? Under, uh, under 60 means over, could be mean over 50. The answer is yes. 50 and yeah. above, yes. Yeah. So the cutoff for GCA is five zero and above. Mm -hmm. All right. What are your thoughts on a patient that presents with no past history of migraine, now is experiencing new onset of frequent migraine and visual aura? In that case, I would probably recommend them to their primary care physician. I think they should get neuroimaged or they should end, or they should be referred, not necessarily urgently, but to, uh, to a neurologist. And I think we're caught up. Very good. Uh, I don't think I'm going to do our final polling question. I think we've exhausted. Uh, I went very heavy in optic nerve. Maybe I should just turn into a two-hour optic nerve and do retinal vascular sometime later. So really with that, I'll launch the poll, let it run, and I'll get my I'll get my slides up if that's what you want. So it looks like people are are going to the stroke I'm gonna, unit. I'm gonna bump you off, Joe. Just gonna take over the screen. I hope that's okay. Were you done? I think I'm pretty much done. I bumped you off, so. All right, I'm gonna stop the poll and, uh, and everyone knows what to do there. Well taught, my, my friend. Getting the thank yous rolling in. Joe, I wanna thank you for doing conversations in optic nerve and, and retinal vascular disease. Again, everyone, this is an interactive distance learning course. Uh, it was great having uh, Joe do this. Joe, we can tell that you have a passion for this. Your depth and knowledge in this is, you know, it's, it's deep and wide. Um, and you take uh, this complex uh, conditions and, you know, it helps me out every time I'm in patient care. And I'm sure it's helping out a lot of the attendees that are here today. So thank you for doing it. You're welcome.